Wow, okay, we've got a great crowd of folks and I'm really so excited to talk to everyone today about this project, um, this community, this emerging platform uh, that uh, we've been working on now for a while. Um, so I'll get started. Uh, and um, for those that just joined, you can see a, a, a link in the chat there. Um, if, if people could keep reposting it again and again for the new attendees, I would really appreciate it. Um, and that's a place where you can um, add your name, tell us a little bit about where you're from so we have a sense of who's in the room and you can add in your own thoughts um, under the notes and question section as we go through the content. Um, great. So uh, we're here to talk about um, building an open scholarship knowledge base uh, together. Uh, my name is April Clyburn Sharon. Um, my background is in epidemiology and I've been working in open research and open scholarship now uh, since about 2014, 2015. Um, and I'm really excited about this uh, collaboration that we've been working on. And um, there's gonna be a lot of exciting stuff coming out um, around this work in the next few months. So um, I'd like to invite everybody to um, get involved if this seems like something that you would be interested in. So we'll talk a little bit about specifically what that would mean. Um, but first, let's do a little bit of housekeeping. Um, that note document is available there for you guys to add your questions um, as they occur to you. Um, but you can also use, they have this Q&A feature built into uh, the Zoom platform itself. So you can also add your uh, questions in there. And at the, the last 15 minutes of the webinar, that's our current plan, is to have the last 15 minutes to be a time where we'll just focus on those questions and get as many answered as we can. Um, so we're going to start with like a little bit about what the Open Scholarship Knowledge Base is and why we're doing it. So I'm going to talk and my colleague Felix uh, Henniger is going to talk a little bit about the origins of why we're here. And um, then we're going to dive into um, how to get involved and help us to make this even better than it's already um, uh, become. So we have Aaron Buchanan, we have uh, Flavio Azevedo, and we have Megan Simmons um, uh, joining us today. So thanks everyone for coming. Um, so let's start with the what, why, and the how of the uh, open scholarship knowledge base. Um, so in short, we're a community. Um, we're a community of people who are advocating uh, for something together, a shared vision. Uh, so we're working with researchers, educators, as well as anyone else that's just interested in opening scholarship. And our aim is to build a knowledge base. Um, and the purpose of building this knowledge base is so that researchers and other uh, stakeholders, librarians, students, um, can more easily uh, learn uh, open scholarship practices and also more easily apply them to their research. Um, so we're focusing on building a, uh, a platform and a community of contributors um, to organize uh, open scholarship information, the resources that are out there that talk about the what of open scholarship, the why of open scholarship, the how of open scholarship, um, all of these aspects to uh, open scholarship so that people can more easily find the resources that they need and can more easily apply those resources to their own questions and their own problems. Um, so this is an open community. So um, people can come and they can use these resources, but they can also contribute um, and they can curate. So this helps us to ensure that we can keep these resources up to date. Um, and that uh, we can create sort of these modular uh, learning resources for people to bring either into um, a course or a workshop or something like that, or for them to learn um, uh, uh, themselves in like a sort of a self-learning, um, self-paced sort of way of learning. Um, so 
the Open Scholarship Knowledge Base is um, a community, uh, first of all. I think the community part of it is um, really central to um, making this knowledge base actually useful. Um, it was uh, spearheaded by some volunteers at the Society for Improvement of Psychological Science. Um, and it's a community now, a growing community of diverse individuals who are aligned um, with a shared goal uh, to make uh, learning and applying open research practices easier. Um, and this is working to solve a problem that we have all faced ourselves. So we're trying to solve a problem that we understand that we are trying to solve for our own um, uh, our own selves and our own community. Um, so researchers, teachers, funders, librarians, um, everybody who is interested, invested in opening up scholarship is welcome to join the community um, either by editing, by curating, and by contributing to this shared community research that we're resource that we're building together. So um, we'll talk a little bit more about how you can uh, join us and how different ways of getting involved a little bit later. Um, but uh, the other aspect of the Open Scholarship Knowledge Base is uh, that it's an ongoing project. The project is to um, curate the existing resources and fill in gaps um, that exist in, in Open Scholarship resources uh, together to make them more easily uh, 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 discoverable and more easily applied um, uh, and, and to, to sort of um, ensure that um, all of these knowledge gaps are, are filled and that people can, um, you know, actually make use of that information for themselves. And then finally, uh, we're building a platform and this is something that we're going to talk a little bit more about um, in the how and why. Um, we're, we're going to be creating a community-led, community-designed hub that will contain modular, open, educational resources. Um, so we're going to be talking a little later with uh, um, Megan Simmons from the OER uh, Commons because this first iteration of the Open Scholarship Knowledge Base, we're going to uh, bring um, this work that we've already started onto the um, OER Commons in the coming few months. Um, and that can be a place where uh, we invite you guys to get involved and help us to make that um, hub as useful as possible for uh, your needs. So um, next I'd like to invite uh, my colleague Felix. Uh, Felix, if you want to talk a little bit about uh, why um, this project started since you were there from the beginning, uh, that would be awesome. Sure thing, April. Um, thanks a lot. It's been a privilege to work with uh, all of you on this project and it's a great thrill to see so many people here today. So why are we doing this? Why are we building this platform? I think the common motivation and observation has been that adopting more open and transparent scholarly practices can be a daunting task for colleagues looking to change the way they work. And that's often due to knowledge gaps. So there's a barrier to adoption uh, because many of us might not be familiar yet with the evolving back pra best practices that uh, change so quickly. And open questions can lead to uncertainty and make things harder than they might be otherwise. So thankfully, there's really many excellent resources out there already that educate and empower researchers that provide practical guidance and help. Um, but it can be hard to keep up um, with them at times unless you follow the literature closely or uh, are very involved, for example, in social media. So what we'd like to do is bring together fellow scholars with common questions around open scholarship and the resources that can help answer those questions. And so we're looking to increase the visibility and accessibility of open scholarly knowledge and to collect and curate and celebrate the materials that are already available out there and create new ones based on the gaps that we identify. So um, yeah, I think that's our mission in a nutshell and what we hope to accomplish. And it's great to see so many people on board. Back to you, April. Thanks so much, Felix. Yeah, so uh, just a reminder, if you have questions um, about anything that we talk about, you can throw them in the Q&A um, section of the Zoom meeting, or you can put them into our webinar notes and we'll, um, we'll address them at the end. Um, great, so I'm gonna do super briefly just a little bit 
what we've done so far. Um, for the most part, uh, it's been um, uh, uh, driven by this um, smaller group of uh, early volunteers who have, um, you know, documented what they think the needs are. They've, um, you know, we've, we've built some sort of social infrastructure, um, trying to figure out the best way to work together since it is primarily community led, it's mostly volunteers. We have to find ways to actually keep things moving as people are, you know, able to chip away in their free time. Um, so uh, we hold monthly community meetings and I'd invite anybody who's interested to attend any of those, they're open meetings. Um, we also have subcommittees that focus on different aspects of the knowledge base that are currently meeting every month as well. Um, and we, we have communication channels, including Slack, um, that we're using to, to you know, keep in touch with each other. Um, so we've worked to sort of lay out what our goals are to try and stay focused on what we want to do first and as well as what we want to do in the longer run, uh, term. Um, we've developed a code of conduct. We've worked on a metadata schema. We've started to collect amazing resources already. Um, and we've tried to, as much as possible, engage other groups um, that are working on similar uh, issues. And one of those uh, groups is uh, uh, going to talk a little later. Um, uh, Flavio is going to talk. Uh, about Fort. Um, we've also tried to figure out what would this platform look like, what's most important at the beginning as we start to build this. So we um, wrote some user stories, we thought about the technical requirements, and especially the tech subcommittee meeting um, lately has been thinking about, okay, how do we actually start this as a prototype? And um, we're very fortunate that uh, Megan Simmons is going to talk about what that might look like um, and um, and what we might be able to do with this early prototype that we're going to build in the coming months. Um, uh, so the prototype is coming. We know kind of what we want to do. Um, and now it's the exciting time where we get to actually make it happen. So if that's the part of a project that you get excited about too, this is the time to join us because we're going to be doing a lot of designing, we're going to be doing a lot of playing around, figuring out what are the possibilities with um, actually bringing this into uh, the real world. Um, so the purpose of the prototype is to illustrate the value of what we're doing and the promise of what the knowledge base could be. So it gives someone, people something concrete to engage with, to try out whether or not this is improving the discoverability of these resources to see how we can keep improving that prototype to um, make these resources more and more discoverable. It's a place where we can also author things collaboratively and we can curate the metadata, we can tag things, we can um, organize things in ways that make them more easily discoverable. Um, and so uh, one of the other steps of this is to create this um, as a project that invites in a wider community. So part of that is going to be um, coming up with processes for people to get involved in very specific ways and to document those and to test them out um, and make sure that people that come to our community know right away, you know, where they can get involved and dive in. Um, and um, we're going to also use this uh, platform as a way of um, you know, bringing in more diverse communities, people from different disciplines, different regions, um, hopefully also people authoring in different languages. Um, and uh, we're going to be doing in the next few months uh, more events, including a virtual hackathon. So if you um, are excited about these types of open, you know, collaborative uh, events, that's a great way for you guys to get involved. We'd love to have you uh, join an upcoming event. So that's kind of our background. That's how we ended up, you know, where we are today. And um, uh, let's go into a little bit about how you um, uh, uh, might be able to get involved. And this is the main sort of uh, purpose of this webinar today is to sort of, you know, shout from the rooftops that we, you know, we welcome what you have, <laughs> you know, your interests in this area, whatever projects you're working on. Um, if there's some alignment there, like we, we really want to bring in, um, um, you know, some diverse perspectives. So please uh, get involved. So I'd like to introduce now Aaron Buchanan, um, who is another longtime volunteer 
And um, uh, tell us a little bit about what you've uh, done, Erin, and what um, people can do if they're interested in joining. Yeah, so I'm Erin. Some of you might know me as the Stats of Doom girl. So I have a very unique interest in this uh, sort of knowledge base because I've been doing this sort of thing and might as well join the team. All right, so um, joined last year at SIPS. So I wore my SIPS shirt to also promote because some of our open hackathons are part of SIPS, which will be free and online for everyone since we can't meet in person. Um, and what we've been doing so far is having these monthly subcommittee meetings. So I'm on the tech committee. And so what each group does is work on a specific section of the important components to making this thing work. So obviously there's a lot of issues on how do we show content? What content do we need? Uh, so I saw someone ask in the Q&A about the quality of content. So there's going to be an editorial group that helps uh, manage those sort of issues with quality and moderation. There is a content based group on what what content do we need? How do we fulfill our user stories and how do we get what the community needs? So not leaving things out that um, You know, we just don't think about because we're in our own little research areas. Uh, governance committee, which I don't actually remember what they do, but they do awesome stuff um, and helping manage such a large project because there's so many pieces. The tech committee has been working probably the most, I think, right now. I'm also partial because I'm on it, but helping pick that platform that will deliver this uh, knowledge base to you guys, uh, which I think Megan is going to talk about at the end. And I'm super excited to see it myself. Um, but I really want to highlight too that there is no experience necessary in delivering messages, reading messages. You just have to be interested because having a broad array of people help us will allow us to get the knowledge pieces that we may have forgotten about or we don't know that exist, but also pro provide those broad perspectives that really make this a well rounded project. Um, so while we have these committees, there are definitely parts that you can contribute to, even if you don't want to join a committee. So you'll be able to contribute on the website that we're going to hopefully see the prototype for and or you can join us on Slack to contribute to the management side of things. So I want to provoke, join us any way possible. Come watch us be goofy at SIPS because I'm goofy all the time and um, help us make this the best product it can be. Back to you, April. <laughs> Thanks, Aaron. Yeah, that was that was perfect. Yeah, so um, there is lots of ways to join. Um, you know, you can join if you want some ongoing, you know, ways of like really digging in and helping make this something that you think works for your interests, for your needs, for your community's needs, you can join a subcommittee. But there's also a lot of other ways to get involved. Um, you can add a resource. Um, you can see here this contributor resource. All of these links are also in our webinar notes if you want to find them there. Um, so that's a simple way. If you know of somebody who is making really great materials already, or if you are, please add them and we'll make sure that they end up in the um, knowledge base. Um, you can also come on and, and um, you know, help us review and improve resources. So, uh, you know, once this is like, you know, migrated onto the OER Commons, you know, there, there will be ways, and Megan will talk a little bit about this, for people to um, remix things, for people to um, really make something their own and improve upon the resources that exist now, um, as well as um, authoring a, a resource. So that's a really exciting thing that we haven't done a lot of so far as a group yet, but I know there's a lot of interest in it and there's a big need for that. So um, uh, if you want to uh, join and you know, say you want to help us test the prototype, you can um, click on this link here and sign up there. If you don't know really what you want to do, but you just sort of like want to be kept in the loop, um, fill out this join OSKB link here. That's sort of a place there'll be a little check boxes and you can pick which things sound interesting and we'll just keep you in the loop and you can join as you have availability and, and based on your interests. Um, so another uh, way, I think this is especially important since we're working on building a knowledge base, 
Another way of getting involved is if you are already working in a group that maybe has a lot of resources or perhaps you're aligned in some way with our aims of opening scholarship, um, then reach out and um, we'll find some way to pool our resources, to work together, to make sure we're not doing redundant work. Um, and so I'd like to invite um, uh, Flavio to talk a little bit about uh, his initiative as well as um, uh, his experience um, trying to work with the OSKB and joining the OSKB in the last few months. All right, thank you for this introduction, April. So uh, one of the ways uh, OSKB intends to achieve its full potential is through partnerships with uh, similarly aligned organizations and projects. That uh, is very broad. So um, one of the reasons why this is important is to, as April said, is reduce uh, uh, redundant work. Sometimes different organizations have the same ideas roughly or they intersect a lot. And instead of doing somewhat comparable efforts, um, efforts can be made so to share resources and the community that is interested um, once there is this aligned uh, projects. So this can uh, be due to, to being on the same discipline, for example, to different organizations within psychology aiming to promote sharing data, for example. It may be project related, say, for example, uh, projects sharing the same goal or topic related, um, for example, replication initiatives. Right. So one uh, example of this coordination with uh, OSKB is FORT. Uh, just as a bit of an intro, in a nutshell, FORT stands for Framework of Open Reproducible Research Training, and it aims to provide a pedagogical infrastructure designed to recognize and support teaching and mentoring of open and reproducible science tenants that are in tandem or at the same time with prototypical subject matters in higher education, basically aggregating um, uh, what we learn from uh, open and reproducible science into our teaching. So FORT strives to be an effective, evolving, and community-driven organization that aims to raise awareness of the pedagogical implications of open and reproducible science and its associated, associated challenges. Think of curricular reform, uh, how we deal with epistemological uncertainty, methods of education, etc. So FORT also advocates for the opening um, of teaching and mentoring materials as a means to facilitate access, discovery, and learning for those who otherwise would be educationally disenfranchised. So OSKB and FORT are aligned in several aspects, we think, um, and one in particular um, that has allowed as a partnership the desire for it is um, the curation of resources. So for FORT, this means equipping scholars with high quality pedagogical tools for open and reproducible research practices in teaching and mentoring. So we have a, a given um, goal that also fits on the same um, uh, mission as OSKB. So for us, instructors can then adapt successful and uh, implemented pedagogies to help ease the tradition, transition and to reduce uh, the instructor's burden in adopting this new, better educational practices. So uh, obviously OSKB has a much larger scope in that respect. So what FOR is doing so that we can adapt uh, and, and partner is to, um, we are currently revising our 700 uh, uh, resources database so that is compliant with OER uh, Commons, which is the database that they are using. Uh, and so that we can facilitate sharing. Uh, we are also aligning our metadata, meaning that we uh, um, um, will enrich our data set and, and, and put it in a way that uh, uh, the uh, passing from one to the other is seamless. Um, and we, uh, uh, we'll also uh, might have a community within OER Commons Hub, uh, which ideally will be uh, adding fork resources into OSKB, as well as enriching their data that is there that other people put, but that are that fit the educational pedagogical mission of fork. So we will also bring that back, but it, it will be the, the same database. Um, 
so that's it. And um, I hope this is useful and um, I'm really excited for this partnership. Awesome, thank you. So there's some links there. Um, uh, they're also in the notes um, where you can learn a little bit more about FORT as well as sign up to uh, um, work with them. So uh, yeah, we're really excited about that. Um, awesome, so we've talked about it this whole time. Uh, we are really excited. This is a very new um, sort of thing. It's just the last you know, couple days that we've gotten confirmation for sure that this is going to be moving ahead. Um, the uh, tech subcommittee has been working a long time on um, trying to think of where this prototype could live at first. Um, and uh, we're really excited about what um, we can do with uh, the OER Commons Hub. So I'd like to invite Megan Simmons. Um, she's going to talk a little bit about, um, you know, what what it is and what it could do. Um, and she's also, uh, if you have questions uh, for her, she'll be able to answer them after uh, she finishes uh, her presentation as well. So I'm going to stop sharing so that she can. Um, there you go. Let oh, me know if you have wonderful. any. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much. Um, actually, I want to put it on gallery view real quick. I just want to see you all. Um, it is so great to be with you all. I am such a fan of your work and you all and I'm just really honored to be uh, able to support you in, in the wonderful work that you're already doing. So um, my name is Megan Simmons. I lead training and design for a nonprofit organization called ISKME. We have one of those wonderful, long, researchy, uh, academic names, which I'm sure you're all familiar with, uh, because we originally started out as a research institute really focused on knowledge sharing. And over the years, our work has expanded. And 12 years ago, I joined the team to lead our training and design work and really be a touch point out to our global education community. So my role in uh, this project is uh, to support you all and uh, work with my team at ISKME to make sure that we uh, create something that's of value to your community and make sure people are trained up and have a good plan and uh, you know everything just goes wonderfully and smoothly. So, so that's, <laughs> that's, that's the hope, yeah. <laughs> Um, and, you know, I just want to say too, so my plan is to uh, actually take you into our digital library and show you, uh, you know, what's possible. Um, but I also, before we jump into that, I just want to kind of acknowledge the times we're in right now. And um, I'm, I'm working from home right now in my, <laughs> my house in Santa Cruz, California, just south of our offices. And um, an interesting thing that I'm seeing, you know, across projects right now is uh, this real uh, desire to connect and collaborate and share and curate resources, which is already kind of what you want to do. Um, but I think this is a really uh, special time to kind of catapult this work forward. And so I think this is actually a really wonderful time to be launching something like this. And you know we're here to, to help you make it successful. So um, I'm going to share my screen right now and actually show you our digital library. And my plan is to just give you a brief overview. Obviously, in the coming you know weeks and months and years, who, who knows how long we'll <laughs> we'll be we'll be together. Um, uh, to just kind of show you what's what's there, what's possible. I want to highlight a few examples and also. Uh, showcase really some interesting innovations I'm seeing from faculty and researchers to address some of the current needs and challenges that we're having right now with school closures. So um, let me just share real quick my browser. Hopefully everybody can see. Uh, okay, thank you. <laughs> um, so this is OER Commons. This is our digital library uh, that has many different tools to facilitate collaboration. Uh, we started this digital library um, with some funding from the Hewlett Foundation back in 2007. And the Hewlett Family Foundation was 
uh, one of the first uh, stewards of OER, um, and they were funding a lot of higher ed uh, institutions in sharing and creating full courses and instructional videos and lectures and things like that. And they wanted a central place where people could access these open educational materials. Uh, and so these are all, uh, as I'm, I'm sure you're all aware, you know, these are all freely available, you know, either under the public domain or they have some kind of uh, open licensing such as Creative Commons. And over the years, uh, the site has uh, changed to adapt to the needs of our global community. So if it's been a while since you've been on the site, there may be some new things, or if this is your first time, uh, this, is, this is what it looks like today. And most people, when they come, they, you know, do a, a search here, you know, on the search bar, maybe they want to narrow it down by subject or education level uh, or educational standard. Um, we also have advanced search options. I'm not going to go through that. I'm kind of assuming that uh, you all uh, can, you know, do that on your own time. Um, but I do want to show the tools that uh, we have to facilitate collaboration. And in particular, uh, we developed these hubs a few years ago because people wanted basically their own space within the library to collaborate, curate, and share resources together. So we basically created wings of the library if we want to kind of compare it to a physical library where people can um, come together around a project or if it's a regional effort or a consortia uh, to uh, create collections, collaborate in groups, author and co-author together. So that's what I want to focus on here today is our hubs. So uh, this is what we have today for our hubs. So maybe uh, some of these uh, hubs represent your interests or your your areas um, but you know they depend on we, we work with a lot of different departments of education for k-12 we work with uh, different uh, higher ed uh, initiatives we have some international work here uh, we have some specific thematic or uh, material types uh, that have projects here and you all will have your own hub soon too. Um, I wanna just showcase uh, one in particular. There's a lot to look at here. So if you know, anyone's welcome to, to poke around and, and see if maybe there's an area of interest uh, that I know April uh, with her background uh, might be interested in this Nordic University Health Hub. They've been doing some really interesting work around public and global health and medical sciences. Um, but I want to just show this project that we've been working with, with all of the uh, community colleges in the state of Michigan. And so there's 28 of them, and they came together to create this hub uh, really to address some of their needs they had uh, with transitioning their courses to use uh, open educational resources. And they identified their uh, high enrollment courses as a priority. And that's what you see here. These collections are uh, curated resources for their different uh, high enrollment courses. So if this is their wing of the library, their collections are basically what's on the shelves of their wing of their library. So this is what their librarians and faculty have said, use this for these courses. Now, in addition to those shelves or, you know, collections, we also have groups and that's this particular hub decided to have groups by college. So each college has their own workspace within the hub where they can collaborate. And uh, so I, if we're using the physical library as a, as a comparison, I see the groups as like a circular table in the wing of the library where faculty and librarians and content specialists and researchers are coming together to collaborate. And I wanted to just highlight Lansing Community College real quick because um, they've been doing some really interesting uh, work with uh, psychology resources, not only curating them, but uh, creating them as well. And their librarian really spearheaded this work 
uh, and her approach, which I love, she said she wanted to curate a bunch of resources and present kind of a buffet to the faculty and say, look, look at all these resources that have been, uh, you know, curated for you. You don't have to reinvent the wheel and then work with them to identify which ones would work best for them and maybe what gap areas uh, they might want to create resources for. So she created these folders within her group to start to curate different resources for the different departments. And in the psychology department, those of you that are psychology faculty and researchers, maybe you've seen some of these. Uh, the OpenStax uh, psychology textbook is one I know a lot of people use. NOBA psychology has some great resources, uh, but they also have curated uh, and created uh, their own resources. So this actually is one of their faculty, Dr. Mark Kelland, who he um, was fortunate enough to get a sabbatical that he could devote to creating uh, open textbooks. So this is what he created. And so when you click on a resource, you get this um, description page here where you can see what kind of license it has. And if there's you know, any specific evaluations on here, uh, and then when you view the resource, uh, it takes you directly to the resource. This resource was created on the site, so you're still on the site. Some resources take you to you know, other sites or, or universities or um, other websites. So um, this is his uh, textbook. And uh, so you, know, you can check it out. It has uh, these different sections. He also included a journal where he documented his process of creating this. Um, and he did this within our authoring tool uh, so that uh, it's kind of nice, it's pretty easy. If you wanna remix this, you can just simply click remix this resource. And basically what happens is you get your own version of his textbook that you can now edit. His original one stays the same, but you basically get a copy of it that you can edit and publish and will be forever connected to to marks so um, i know there's some of you that are creating things so i just wanted to show you that there are some really great uh, tools here to support that um, i wanted to just share one other thing or actually two other things uh, that i've just seen um, faculty and researchers really uh, step up in the time of this pandemic to uh, work together to create resources. And this particular project is uh, something that was also created in our authoring tool uh, by anthropology faculty from eight different universities around uh, the US. I believe it was initiated by faculty in, uh, at Columbia University and Rice University. And basically what they wanted to do was start to create mini lectures uh, where anthropologists, faculty, and researchers are presenting their research in short little uh, video lectures and then also including supplemental materials to go along with that. So this is Paige. Uh, her, she's presenting, uh, any of you that are in, into anthropology, I highly recommend checking this one out, but she did some really interesting research in Papua New Guinea and she's uh, presenting that and then she has uh, some different activities uh, associated with it. So uh, I thought this was a really great example of just how uh, you know uh, faculty and researchers are meeting this moment right now to uh, come together and create something that can be used you know across in institutions. One other resource I wanted to share is the clinical practice support uh, that and this is um, in the spirit of kind of you know putting your first draft out there this is something that i'm working on with teacher education faculty so it's definitely not perfect this is kind of our first draft um, and this is basically um, uh, to meet a challenge that now that teacher uh, educators and their students uh, can't physically be in schools how can we recreate this or facilitate this in a virtual space? So uh, having them observe various videos uh, of teachers uh, reflecting on that and then planning using some lesson plan templates. So uh, there's some really exciting things happening 
uh, here to meet some of these immediate needs. So I know you all have a lot of ideas of what you want to share and I've already done some great work, but I wanted to just uh, share a little bit of inspiration for, for how folks are ad addressing some of these needs. So um, I know I showed a lot, but I just wanted to kind of, you know, give you, give you a sense of what's there and what's to come. And you all are our fellow uh, curators, digital librarians, and instructional designers and advocates and leaders. So we really want to work together with you to make sure that the hub is a good representation and support for your, for your communities and what you want to do. So um, with that, I'm happy to take any questions or if you want to see anything else, there's so much to see here. Um, but uh, there, um, you know, we'll have more, more opportunities to, to uh, connect and, and work together in the coming months. Thanks, Megan. That's perfect. So we are now, this has never happened to me before, exactly on time. <laughs> a round of applause so uh let me start with uh we do have a question in the q a and then i'll go to the notes and we can take a look and see what people have shared in there um so the first question is from david mower um his question is uh do you have a quality filter for allowing resources into the system which is an excellent question because it's one of the things that especially the editorial subcommittee and the content subcommittee has been talking a lot about. Um, and um, I think Megan can probably chime in a little bit as well about uh, what is already built in to the system. But yeah. I think um, the short answer, uh, David, is um, that we do wanna have a layer of some sort of editorial and review in the knowledge base. Um, and that does not necessarily mean that we will not accept um, other um, forms of content, but that we do want to be able to sort of add a layer of, you know, you know, this has been reviewed, it's been given feedback, it's been updated, it's, it's you know, something that is considered uh, trusted within the community for a way for that sort of to be, um, you know, people can search through those uh, uh, resources specifically, um, but uh, currently we're we're working through out, you know where is the line between that and um, you know having a space for people to have some rough drafts there for um, open collaboration and stuff like that as well. So it'll be a little bit about um, being able to organize our materials so people can easily tell the difference between the two as well as know how to give feedback on something that, you know, does need some improvement. Um, and so Megan, if you want to add a little bit about, I saw they yeah. had an endorsement feature as well as yeah. uh, what else was, there is two different ways. Yeah, so there's yeah. a couple different layers. First is our team of digital librarians are um, always assessing things that get submitted. Um, and I can share that criteria with you all if you're interested in digging in on that. So that's, that's you know, kind of our first line of quality control. And, uh, you know, just to be clear, our digital librarians aren't, uh, you know, experts in every single subject and every single thing that gets submitted. So it's kind of, you know, a general quality evaluation. Um, but we also have, you know, in the spirit of open and OER and open source, this crowd source uh, methodology and, and way that we um, can give star ratings to resources. We have specific rubrics and quality evaluation tools from Achieve to assess. We also have endorsements that people can give. So that's something we can talk about if uh, you all want to have your own specific endorsement so that you can put them on the resources and say, okay, this gets our stamp of approval. Um, we also have ways within the collaboration we do in groups to um, put some kind of approval measures in place so that before something that gets submitted to a collection or from a group, uh, gets evaluated um, by an administrator or a curator of the group. Um, but yeah, you know, the spirit of, um, you know, putting out your first draft and continuous improvement and iteration of resources and peer review and feedback, that is so much of what we're all about. So 
um, you know, we really try to facilitate that and encourage that um, because a lot of people could just kind of focus on the resources, but I think one of the most exciting parts of uh, open educational practice is uh, the shifts that we need to make to improve how we design resources, how we collaborate, how we evaluate, uh, and how we advocate. So uh, that's all part of it too. So the materials are really important, but I also think the professional learning and development that can happen through shifting your practice to a more collaborative approach is, um, is where we see a lot of a lot of uh, benefit and value add. So, um, you know, we can talk about however many kind of restrictions or restraints or, you know, um, boxes to check uh, in, in terms of our workflows once we start to design the hub. Um, but that's, that's a great question and something to think about if you wanna be more kind of open and just kind of see what happens and, you know, crowdsource it, or if you want to, you know, put in some specific, um, you know, endorsements or um, evaluation metrics so that, um, you know, there's, there's more quality control. It's totally, it's totally up to what you all want to do. Yeah, and I would, I would just like to uh, uh, invite people that are interested in these types of questions to consider joining our editorial subcommittee because that is the bulk of what we're talking about. We do want to have people who are focusing on, you know, ensuring that the resources are relevant, that they're appropriate. Well, we will, as a community, sort of come up with our, you know, ideas about what's important. And those, that subcommittee will be managing a lot of those sort of questions. So, yeah, please join us. Oh, and one other thing, sorry, yeah. I, I just thought of something else. Um, we've seen in terms of authoring and remixing uh, content in addition to quality evaluation rubrics we've seen people create templates that can be kind of a starter for folks that want to create resources um, and you know we can even have like links and, and instruction there to really help guide people in creating high quality drafts and within our authoring tool i didn't show this but i'm happy to if people want to see it we actually have an accessibility checker. So for those of you uh, that are, you know, working uh, with, uh, you know, students that or um, colleagues that use screen readers or, you know, need to access content in EPUB 3 format uh, that's braille ready, we have a checker within our, uh, our authoring tool that you basically click on to check your content and it will flag anything that does not um, that isn't accessible and give you tips on how to make it accessible and you can either ignore it or you can <laughs> fix it. So that's another, uh, you know, quality tool that we've put in place to help people, uh, you know, think about accessibility. And I have to just say from my personal experience, I'm not an accessibility expert. I've learned so much in our collaboration. We work with uh, CAST and their universal design for learning on this. And, um, you know, I always kind of just wanted to make things look pretty, but now I know, like, that's not necessarily accessible. <laughs> so I've learned a lot, uh, you know, through the accessibility checker just on, you know, how to really design something so that my students um, can, can use it. Um, so that's another kind of quality control measure that we have in place. But I'm curious if, if others have, um, you know, kind of other <laughs> quality considerations. Maybe that's something we can talk about another time um, because we can certainly put those kind of supports in there. Oh yeah, thanks April. And this is just um, a slide with some of the links. We have this in our notes to, uh, you know, just quickly, uh, you know, one of some of the things that I, that I showed. Um, but I know we have a few more minutes. I'm happy to, you know, show anything else you want to see or, or answer any other questions. Awesome. Yeah. And, and um, just to follow up on what you just said, if people do have things that, you know, from their experience, they know we should be considering when we're talking about, you know, uh, curating these resources, including quality. Um, and you can either join us, you know, fill out that those, um, you know, links that I shared earlier. Um, uh, or you can leave those thoughts here in the thoughts and questions as well. And because we're going to review this as a group and see what sort of feedback people um, have left us. So let's take a look and see if we have questions in here. I'm so excited that there are so many of you interested in this. 
um, are as excited as we are about it. Uh, let's see, notes, 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 notes. Maybe we don't have, oh, here we are, questions. Okay, so this first one, there you go. Is the Fort 700 resources database open already? And you've already answered that, right? That that was you? No? Okay, well, somebody else knew. I stuck the link in there. I knew where it was. So. That's great. Okay, so what is the acronym that Megan is using? Oh, this is, this is why I love collaborative notes. <laughs> Some of the questions can just be answered by the other people in the room. Um, so yeah, and if you want to hear more about that organization, I'm sure Megan would love to hear from you um, and talk about it. Um, would data management training materials be in the scope? Because there's this awesome data management training resources from ESIP. Yes. So um, one of the things we've been working uh, towards, and we've actually spoken to these people at the um, ESIP data management training resources clearinghouse, um, is one, making sure all our metadata is aligned to begin with, um, and two, eventually to have sort of our, um, eventually our platforms communicating with each other. So when a new, off, when a new resource that falls into um, ESIP's area of interest comes into the Open Scholarship Knowledge Base, that that can actually be like pushed and pulled into their database and vice versa. That's sort of a, you know, a longer term goal for us. But the first step is having the metadata be aligned. Um, and yeah, we've talked, we've talked to them. And uh, the other way that we're thinking about aligning with those sort of groups is some of them might want to do what Fort's considering doing and being a group within the hub. Um, so yeah, definitely want to be collaborating. And if you know other groups like that awesome group at ESIP that, um, you know, let us know. Because we want to make sure we're not missing, um, you know, anybody. Quality control resources um, of resources. Yes. So this is something we talked about a little bit from uh, David Mower's question. Um, we will have a few different things going on, mechanisms going on that should um, at least ensure that there's a certain level of, you know, reliability and guard against misinformation. Um, and then within that have some resources that are really more formally, um, you know, edited and endorsed. Um, what licenses does OER Commons support for materials shared in its database? That's an excellent question. Uh, Megan, do you want to answer that? Yes. Um, and maybe I'll just share my screen. We'll, oh, well, actually, okay, I won't. Never mind. <laughs> um, so uh, yeah, so we, um, you know, our authoring tool that I showcased, uh, you can select uh, different licensing. Um, Creative Commons, like I mentioned, is one of the most common ones that people use. And within using a Creative Commons license, you always get attribution. So that means you get credit. And then you can select if you uh, want uh, people to, you know, use it for commercial purposes or if you want to allow derivative works. So if you want to allow people to remix and modify your resource. Um, we also have, you know, resources that are in the public domain. We have uh, fair use resources in there. We also have custom licenses in there. Uh, and all of this is in that metadata of the resource so you can you know see the the license and click on it to learn more um, so so that's how we have it designated um, and we also have uh, you know other like international license like the GNU license um, so yeah I know that there's folks from uh, all over the world here so if you're uh, using an international license that is um, you know, allows for it to be openly shared and used, um, you're welcome to share as well. So there's not just like one, one set of licenses because any of you that <laughs> dig into copyright, <laughs> there is, <laughs> it's, a, it's a whole world unto itself, uh, but we really try to simplify it in the metadata, the description on the resources, so it's easy to know how you can use it. But awesome. everything is freely available, you know, you don't have to pay, no login, things like that. It's just the license may say, like, if you can, you know, make derivative works or remix it. Some of the videos don't allow you to do that, but you can use them and download them and things like that. So, 
yeah, we can do more, we can do a deeper dive into licensing too, if that's of interest to the community. Um, yeah, no, that's great. So I think uh, in the last couple of minutes, I'm just gonna try and touch on those last three questions. Um, the next question is, to what extent does OER Commons aim to be a global resource database and how's that reflected in governance? So um, just wanna distinguish a little bit the OER Commons uh, platform versus the OSKB. So OSKB, we do have aims of being a global resource. And in terms of governance, governance is still um, probably our um, currently earliest in the stages of working together subcommittee, if that makes sense. Um, there's a lot of work to do there to make that like to, to think in the long term of how do we what what challenges, what barriers, what sort of ways do we need to work through to make this a truly go global um, uh, collaboration. So if you're interested and if you have experience in that, please, um, you know, fill out that form and uh, say you want to join a subcommittee and we'd love to hear from uh, your ideas on how to do that. Um, open Science MOOC, absolutely. This is great. Uh, some people um, from our community have worked on that as well. Um, and uh, part of our greater uh, uh, mission is to make all of these lovely resources, you know, to point to them from the OSKB so people can find them if they don't know about them. Um, and then uh, just quickly, I know this is quick, but we're kind of at time right now, is what aspects of openness do we aim to cover? I think our current focus right now has been on a lot of those things that are mentioned in the question, reproducibility, data, methods, stuff like that. Um, but we do believe in those other aspects of inclusiv inclusivity um, and um, open approaches to collaboration. So uh, we want to include those things as well um, and uh, really welcome if you have experience in those areas or are interested in that, please um, sign up. We've got these three little ways of signing and joining. Um, so I really would love to hear um, you know, all of your ideas on what you think uh, you're excited about, what challenges you think we'll face, um, any, anything you want to do to to join us. We're really uh, looking forward to growing the community um, in the coming months. Uh, okay, so I know I went through the questions quickly at the end, but um, uh, you can uh, shoot uh, me an email at oskb at cos.io um, with any other questions that you have um, and uh, I hope to hear from uh, you all in the coming months. Thanks so much for your time and thanks all panelists for coming today. Uh, you know that you're what keeps this you know going so I really appreciate uh, all the work that you've done. Um, so I don't want to go over time. I will leave this slide up and I will say uh, thanks again. Um, have a good day and uh, see you all at the next community meeting. <laughs>